Uh, you're right, this is the first time we're presenting this, uh, and in fact, if truth be known, we, <laughs> um, if that's for me, take a message. Uh, uh, if truth be known, we started writing this presentation yesterday um, and got the data uh, one month ago. <laughs> Henrik has been working with another colleague of ours uh, in Shanghai. Um, so uh, this is all very fresh to us, and there may be mistakes, uh, and I'm counting on the collective wisdom here uh, to correct us. Um, so let me start by um, defining this funny term, choice architecture, that um, my friend Cass Sunstein and I coined. Um, so it's funny, when you invent a term, then you're the expert in that. Now, we made it up. Right, so it, it, just make up any two words and then you're the world's leading authority in, in that thing. So uh, what is choice architecture? It's the design of the environment in which people make choices. So three of us went out for dinner last night. It turned out we were at a restaurant with a very long wine list, um, they, which they handed to me, which is always dangerous. And, uh, you know, the, the wine list, it was organized by country and then by a region of country. That's one way to organize a list. There are lots of others. Um, so, the, you know, one, one person is in charge of selecting those wines. The other is in charge of organizing the way you choose. And that's what choice architecture is. And... Um, you can think, who's, a, who's good at choice architecture? Amazon. You go to that website, there's millions of books, but you have no trouble finding uh, many that you want. The idea of choice overload uh, is only a problem when there's bad choice architecture. So um, we're going to talk about choice architecture in this context. Now, we know from previous studies that choice architecture has powerful effects. So for example, uh, the, the idea of automatic enrollment in pension plans has proved to be extraordinarily powerful. Um, in the UK, when they introduced their uh, version of a plan like this, um, uh, Lord Adair Turner, had the idea of uh, using automatic enrollment. And there were many people who said, no, we need to make it mandatory. Uh, but they used automatic enrollment, and the opt-out rate has been less than 10%. So uh, extraordinarily successful. Um, so uh, in this context, our, our new fresh look at this, um, uh, it's been yeah, 13 years since we wrote the first paper, we now have a chance to see whether these nudges uh, last for a long time or kind of vanish. So um, this is probably all familiar to all of you, but let's get all on the same table. Um, when the premium pension plan was started, uh, there was a default fund that was selected, um, but uh, the government decided that um, people should be discouraged from making that choice and instead uh, encouraged to make a portfolio of their own of up to five uh, mutual funds that were offered in the, in the plan. Uh, and they had about 450 to choose from. So uh, kind of like the wine list last night, but they were asked to create their own cuvee. Um, and um, both the government and the funds advertised. Uh, I believe this was the largest advertising campaign in the history of Sweden. So the government was advertising that you should choose for yourselves. Uh, 
and um, the fund companies were saying you should pick us. The private ads were not what you would normally call informative. Uh, here's an example. So I'm not sure why they chose Harrison Ford as their spokesperson. He's not known for his knowledge of finance, but um, I think it's fair to say that investors were not, didn't learn much from this ad, and unless there's the small print there is more informative than Henrik has led me to believe. So um, w what happened? Uh, well, there are two nudges here. One is there's a default, and then there's the government and the private sector nudging you not to take it. Uh, so who, which nudge won? Uh, in this case, it was the nudge to be independent. And uh, two-thirds of the participants uh, followed the advice to form their own portfolio. Um, now, then the advertising stopped. The government stopped its campaign at uh, independent choice. The fund companies um, stopped because the new entrants uh, were only a couple hundred thousand a year. So a much smaller target, and uh, perhaps they had anticipated one of our findings of, uh, of inertia, that it was really worth it to advertise at the beginning because you might get a customer for life. Um, so uh, things changed. Um, and here's a plot of the percentage of people choosing to form their own portfolio. And we can see the two-thirds in the first year, and there's some lingering <coughs> effects of that, but it, uh, within three years it dropped down to 10%, and now it's uh, about 1,000 people a year uh, are, are choosing to form their own portfolio. I'll come back to that in a minute. So um, you can think of this, this is uh, a unique opportunity for me to look at the long-term effect of nudges. So uh, as I say, there were two. Um, one was to join the default fund, which two-thirds of the people did, and coincidentally, about two-thirds of them stayed. So, for the, that's a million people, um, have, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm confused. So one third of the people took the default fund, which was the default, that was the nudge, and uh, most of them have stuck with it. The people who uh, chose to be self-directed were even, uh, no, I'm, I'm completely getting this backwards, right? Yeah, no, no, okay, it's okay. Uh, I, I wish I could blame this on jet lag, but I've been in Europe for a week. So um, the, the bottom line here is both groups are sticky. If you were nudged into the default, you tended to stay there. If you were nudged to be independent, you stayed with that. Okay, let me get off this slide before I... <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, uh, we're, what are we left with? Two and a half million people still acting as their own portfolio managers uh, 17 years later. Uh, but now uh, almost everybody is taking the default. And now, what about that default? Um, uh, you know, it, it's uh, mostly very good, uh, it's cheap, uh, it's globally diversified, uh, but it's, let's say, unusually aggressive in ways that I'll get into in a minute. So, um, 
It's essentially, uh, and I'll show you some details, uh, it tracks very closely to a global index. Um, the index, the fact that it does so, I think is quite wise because uh, otherwise there could be all kinds of political pressure to invest in Swedish companies or in country, uh, companies from this country or not in that country. Uh, so if you just say basically we're going to buy the global market more or less, um, I, I, I think that's wise. Uh, the fees are uh, quite low, 16 basis points. That's great. Um, it has a so-called target date structure, uh, which means that the equity exposure gradually declines uh, as you age. And um, in, what was it, 2011, um, it was decided to add uh, leverage, uh, and I'll explain what that is in a second. Okay, so that's the default fund. Um, this chart gives you a sense of how closely the fund tracks the index. So these are the, the top 10 holdings in the fund, and that's in the left column. In the right column, you see the weights in the uh, MSCI index, and you can see they're very close, and in fact, the correlation between the two is 0.99. So uh, this is very close to being an index fund. Um, now, let's compare it with uh, similar default funds in the US. Uh, what you see is, um, the AP7 fund is uh, cheaper, um, considerably cheaper, but um, um, much more aggressive. So uh, its use of leverage is uh, unusual, um, and the so nominally it's a hundred percent in stocks, but as, as we'll see, it's actually more like 125% in stocks. Um, so what does leverage mean? Uh, essentially, the fund borrows uh, and, to, and uh, with those funds um, buys options on the future return on the market. Um, it's very cheap to borrow right now. And um, the limit the, uh, on how much they can lever, I believe, is uh, 50%. So in principle, the fund could be 150% uh, in equities, essentially. Uh, but right now, and it, it was at 50% leverage for a few years, it's uh, now at 25%. Now, um, here's the uh, performance of the fund and the index, and you can see the point at which leverage was introduced, and um, with wise and or lucky timing, uh, the leverage was introduced at a very good time, and uh, Whereas before, the fund and the index are looking very similar. Uh, afterwards, um, the, the fund takes off. Um, th this shows you what the fund uh, would be without leverage. And um, you can see that if you take away the leverage, there's hardly any difference. So, what do we think about this leverage? Um, it, how, let's first think about how individuals might feel about this. Uh, and how they think about it 
will depend on whether they take a, a broad or narrow view. Um, the broad view would be to say, well, uh, the premium pension is just a small part of the overall system, uh, about a sixth. So, and it's the only part that's explicitly invested in equities. So, whereas 125% of this part sounds very aggressive, um, if, if we computed the equity exposure in the entire fund, uh, it would be quite small. Um, and, uh, furthermore, uh, the social security system is not the only place that uh, people have savings. Uh, many will have private pensions, uh, many will have homes uh, where they will have some equity, they may have other savings. So uh, the, the broader the view that we take of the individual's portfolio, the smaller this equity exposure looks. Um, and uh, there's, there's a coherent argument uh, one can make for using leverage, and um, it's actually something I've written about. Um, so, especially right now, uh, the government can borrow at astonishingly low interest rates, and historically, uh, stocks have returned higher than bonds. In fact, so much higher that there's a long economics literature on what's called the equity premium puzzle. Uh, the equity premium is the difference in returns on stocks and bonds. Uh, that difference has been large, historically six or seven uh, percent. Most people think that it's likely to be smaller going forward, though of course no one knows. Uh, but even if it's, say, 3%, half of the historic, if you can borrow at today's interest rates and invest and get a 3% premium, that sounds like a pretty smart thing to do. And I've argued uh, with another one of, Henrik was one of my students, another one of my former students, uh, we've written a paper saying that the equity premium comes because people evaluate their portfolios too often, and if they would just close their eyes and not look, then they would be happy uh, investing in equities. So, um, th this is the, the pro-leverage argument, um, but w one can ask, whether that's the way investors will actually treat it. Um, in fact, uh, they may take a narrow view and look at this part of the portfolio in isolation rather than as part of the overall portfolio. Uh, when they get their orange envelope, you can see I've been deep into the details here of knowing the colors in which the information is received. Um, in the orange envelope, the returns on the premier pension fund are split out. So you, you don't get some one number saying, this is the income that you're projected to receive in retirement. You, you, uh, you get some information about the rest of the fund and then this one and uh, so I think it's fair to say that many will look at this fund separately as, in, as investors. And um, we've seen in the last uh, couple decades that it is possible for markets to go down. Um, we had the crash of the tech bubble and then uh, the financial crisis, and uh, we've, we've seen stocks fall as well as rise. Um, so I'm suggesting we conduct uh, what my friend Danny Kahneman calls a pre-mortem. Now we all know what a post-mortem is. 
Uh, the literal postmortem is after somebody dies. The, uh, the postmortem we typically do is after some disaster. So if you think about the, the Challenger disaster when um, uh, a uh, space mission um, blew up uh, on takeoff, uh, there was a very long analysis afterwards as to what happened, and uh, we learned that um, cold weather was the fault. So what, what would have happened if there had been a premortem? Well, the way you do a premortem uh, is you say, let's suppose that there was a disaster. What caused it? And the great physicist Richard Feynman, uh, in the congressional testimony, fa famously took one of those O-rings and stuck it in a glass of ice water and uh, showed what would happen to it. Imagine we had hired, we had had the foresight to hire Feynman and other people like that to go through, say, a week-long exercise where they imagine there's been a disaster and what caused it. Uh, perhaps uh, Feynman would have said, oh, well, you know, if you took off in cold enough weather, I could imagine that being a problem. So that's the exercise that I want to do here and say, suppose sometime in some meeting down the road, after the current minister has gone off to do something else, there's been some disaster, and uh, it's front page news all over Sweden. Uh, what caused it? Uh, and you know, the argument is it's better to do pre-mortems than to have to do post-mortems. So uh, one scenario to think about is we have another financial crisis. Um, there are plenty of others. Uh, many involving the current leader of my country. So, uh, but, so we can imagine bad stuff happening. Uh, we'll just take this one uh, because we, we have the numbers. Um, and let's ask uh, what would the effect of leverage be if we had an exact replay of the financial crisis? So um, the crisis was pretty bad. From peak, from peak to trough, um, the index that, uh, it, that we match here in the default fund fell more than 50%. Now, leverage increases your returns when markets go up. It increases your losses when markets go down. Um, if we had 25% leverage, uh, the returns would have been down 68%, 50% leverage minus uh, almost 82%. So um, you can imagine 82% headlines. Uh, and um, yeah, they might cause certain ministers to run to their cabins. So, um, now, we could imagine it worse that this time Sweden uh, avoids uh, the brunt of it internally, so the Swedish economy didn't suffer as much as uh, many others, especially many other parts of Europe uh, to the south. Um, but suppose this time uh, Sweden is hit as hard as some other countries. Well, in that case, the fall in this part of the pension plan would be accompanied by high rates of unemployment, uh, budget crises uh, within the government. Um, and uh, so what would the effect of this be? What, what would be the reaction of the board? What would be the reaction in parliament? Um, and would there be pressure on the government to somehow reimburse 
costs people for some of these losses, considering that it w the argument could be made that they had been nudged into this fund. Now, of course, the government could say, actually, we nudged you not to take it, but um, you did create that fund, and uh, it was your decision to add the leverage. So anyway, you can see how this argument is going to play out. And um, remember, we're doing a pre-mortem, so we want to worry about uh, what might happen. Um, here's another pre-mortem. Uh, as the minister mentioned, uh, and as you know better than me, um, there have been some funds that have engaged in some nefarious behavior. Um, it's unrealistic to think that, A, they're the only ones that ever did that, uh, or B, that no one will think of anything else. And um, so suppose other scandals arrive, um, what, what would happen and what should we do about it? Um, should the funds be more closely monitored? Uh, if so, by whom? Um, uh, there are close to 900 funds, so a detailed audit of all of their activities would be uh, extremely expensive. Um, and if this monitoring takes place, who should pay for it? Um, and uh, our, again, one can ask, would the government be expected to bear some responsibility uh, in the case of, say, a catastrophic failure of one of the individual funds in the portfolio? Suppose there's fraud and people lose half their money in a flat market. Um, it, when things like that happen, uh, fingers get pointed, and um, it, if I were the minister, th this is one of the things that would uh, keep me up at night. So um, there are lots of alternative choice architectures. Uh, the status quo is the one on the left. So there is a default. And people either take the default or they go to the fund square. And we didn't have time for any fancy graphics. We could have divided that up into 900 pieces. Um, so they're told, go in there and um, make your dinner. Um, here are your ingredients. Um, the structure that I have advised uh, companies and uh, other institutions to use in the US is uh, slightly different, uh, and it's pictured on the right. Um, in the US, the automatic enrollment is growing. More than half of the large firms uh, in the US use it. If if you have automatic enrollment, you must have a default fund because automatic enrollment is for the people who are too clueless to join a plan where their contributions are being matched by their employer. So if they're not awake enough to do that, uh, then you have to give them a, uh, somewhere to put their money. And so that requires a default. So there is, and that, the target date funds I showed you earlier are uh, typically what goes in that box. Um, now, uh, yeah, the structure that, that I like is to say, here's the default fund, and if you literally don't reply to your mail, that's where you were gonna put your money. If you at least open the envelope or the website, uh, you would see something like, here's the default fund, 
And if you don't want to choose at all, uh, we recommend that you do that. But there are variations on that default fund. Um, and you can just think about them as varying in uh, how aggressive they are. You, you, there could be other varieties. You could imagine that there's a fund that uh, is uh, a socially responsible fund, so it just takes uh, those stocks and then crosses some off that engage in some activities. I don't want to be the person that has to decide which of those get crossed off, but I'm just suggesting there are lots of ways of imagining what these alternatives would be. But the point is, all of these funds would share the good characteristics that the current default fund has, namely low fees and global diversification. And they would vary on other dimensions to be determined by policymakers. Um, and we'd say, you know, you take any of those and you, we're guaranteeing you a globally diversified fund at a good price. If you want, there are these other funds down here. We've put in prob perhaps an overly dramatic uh, warning sign. Um, but the, the point would be there, uh, there would be something there that says, you're welcome to do whatever you want and uh, pick individual funds, but uh, it, what you get is up to you, and you're certainly not guaranteed of global diversification or uh, very low fees. The, uh, the fund has done a very good job of regulate. All the fees in the fund are quite cheap, but the fees for the other funds are not as cheap as the Default fund. So let, let me uh, give you one anecdote. One of um, uh, another behavioral economist, uh, David Labson, uh, he and I uh, were on the board of a foundation in New York uh, together. I was in the last of my 10 year stay and he was in the first of his, you can, as you can guess, he was my replacement. They wanted a younger model of the behavioral economist seat, so uh, they took David. And uh, it, it so happened that David had been in charge of revising the pension plan at Harvard, and uh, so we asked him to help do that for the foundation. And the argument David and I got into we have this structure at the foundation, and the argument we got into is whether this bottom square should exist at all. Uh, David's view was no, um, and my view was it's okay, essentially because hardly anybody takes it. So in the US market, typically the number of people electing that is a, less than 5%. So, but you know, this is an argument between two friends who agree about almost everything. You can see there's a pretty narrow range of disagreement here. But you, you can make the argument, we shouldn't even have that. I'm not gonna make that argument. Uh, especially, I think it would be difficult to do that in light of the history of this fund, where people were originally encouraged to choose there and uh, have been there for 17 years, but um, and let me just say one last thing. If a switch like this were made, then one might consider a restart. In other words, you could consider saying uh, it's been 17 years or 18 or 19, however long this uh, would take. Um, uh, the board has decided to make some changes. In light of that, everybody is going to be asked, 
to re-enroll. Once again, you know, you re-enroll and then you're in this, right? You're in the one on the right. And uh, so if you do nothing, well, actually you'd have a choice. So there, you either uh, get the same thing as you had before or you get the new default, and, uh, right? So the, those would be the two obvious things to do with people who don't do anything. Um, and otherwise, people who actively engage would be treated just the same way that newcomers are. That uh, they would say, all right, there's this default, and then there's this variation, varieties of defaults, and, uh, and then there's the fun square. Um, you can decide if we had this structure what the default fund might look like. Um, perhaps it would uh, have no leverage, uh, in which case adding leverage would be an option, uh, and uh, less than 100% equities would also be an option. I mean, that's one way of sorting it out. Um, so uh, here are the design issues I think we need to think about. Uh, right now, less than half of 1% of new entrants are going to the fund square. Um, and uh, well, the, these bullets are really what I've just talked about before. So, I, I will skip them. Um, so the, let's talk about the fund square. Uh, there are now almost 900 funds down there. Uh, there are about 200,000 people a year enter the system. About 1,000 choose from those funds. So we're approaching the point where there's one fund per person. And that seems to be a lot, right? <laughs> I mean, um, that's all I'll say about that. Um, and, uh, okay, so let me, let me conclude uh, with, uh, I think the questions that, uh, the minister and the board uh, should be thinking about what, what are the goals of this? Um, is it to maximize the expected retirement income of participants? Um, is it CYA? Is it minimizing the risk to the people who run it, both the government and the uh, administrators? Um, and more generally, who should bear all of the risks? The, the, the risks of uh, funds misbehaving, to use one of my favorite new words, um, or, uh, and who should bear the risk of market downturns? Um, and um, if, uh, leverage is thought to be inappropriate or excessive, uh, that, are there alternatives? And um, one possibility would be to increase the size of the premier pension component. So it's now two and a half percent out of 15, 16, something like that. I don't know where that number comes from. Uh, but one could easily imagine that it was increased, um, in which case, say, suppose that equity, there's lever leverage were eliminated, but people had 5% in the premier pension, their total exposure to equity would go up, but uh, they would be getting the equity in a less risky way. Um, and, um, I think, gi given the fact that essentially every new entrant is taking the default, uh, 
I think the government has to decide whether it's appropriate uh, to nudge them into a fund that's that risky. Uh, I'm, I'm not prejudging anything, um, but I, I think that's a question that has to be asked. Uh, I, and I think uh, the fact that that nudge is so powerful uh, forces us to ask this question particularly uh, strenuously. Okay. Uh, I'm done. Do we have time for a few questions? Yeah, so I think mean, if we set up the presentation of Anders Anderson, in the meantime, we have time for two or three questions from the room. So if you have a question, yeah. raise your hand and someone with a microphone will come and ask you. And say who you are and your name. Yeah. Hello, my name is Mats Langesh. Uh, I have one, there are many interesting points you make, but one question I have, which is a very important in the Swedish debate, is the balance between the bearer of the risk of your money that is being contributed versus sort of steering into fewer choices. And, uh, do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, do the money belong to the individual and he takes the risk of the what happens if it performs bad or performs good? Should yeah. they have the choice? Uh, well, I, I, I think, so the dilemma here is that the plan was designed to give people lots of choice. And people were encouraged to take advantage of that opportunity to choose. Gradually, people have stopped doing that. So um, it's fine to say, look, you chose this. Uh, you know, suffer the, uh, you know, you get the gains and you uh, experience the losses. It, if half a percent of people are taking advantage of that, then I, th I think that the responsibility shifts a bit. Um, so, I mean, that's really the, I, and I'm not, I'm not saying what anything, you know, far be it from me to tell anybody what to do. I'm trying to raise questions. Uh, up here. Yeah, hello. Uh, yeah, uh, Anders at Stockholm University. I'm just curious about the leverage in the U.S. default funds. Yeah, that was no. zero. And is there like a regulatory, or a, some kind of legal reason they're not leveraged at all, or is there anything I, we should know about that? I, somebody else may know. I, I'm pretty sure it would not be legal. Uh, that the regulator, uh, don't quote me on that, <laughs> but um, there, are, there are all kinds of regulations. Um, uh, there's, uh, it falls under something called ERISA, and I'm pretty sure you would, the, the, in private plans, the employer has a fiduciary responsibility to choose the funds. And uh, essentially is responsible for each fund. Uh, this system is different any fund that meets certain minimal requirements is permitted in. So um, the, the plan sponsor, the company, I, I don't know whether they would be prevented or their lawyers would prevent them from uh, introducing a fund that had leverage. They, they, right, as you know, we like to sue people in the United States. Um, so I, I think, uh, especially having a default fund with leverage, uh, no lawyer would allow uh, a company to do that. And I've never heard of it, but I, I can't say that it doesn't exist. <laughs> 